up friends and welcome back. In the last video, we continued on talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 1 when he talked about the gospel that he preached was not something he learned in a seminary, a Bible college, but it was taught to him and it was the revelation of Jesus Christ. We started looking at the Holy Spirit and his ministry. We, we looked at the fact that he is a person a very noble person that desires to get to know us. I said that the Holy Spirit was active in Jesus's ministry, and I want to look at a few scriptures now. We kind of looked in John chapter 16, and we saw how Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit with a masculine pronoun. And the real shame of what we see in the church today is very few people seem to understand that he is a knowable person. They think of him as this intangible force, this inanimate object, this presence that manifests in our service without realizing that he's a person that desires to partner with us, to fellowship with us, to hold us when we're hurting, to comfort us when we're down, to, to teach us about Jesus, to reveal Jesus to us. He wants to be involved in every single aspect of our lives. And when you look at the Holy Spirit, and you look at different people throughout church history, one thing you'll notice is that there are some people who seem to have been helped by the Holy Spirit a lot more than others. Does this mean he's a respecter of persons? Does that mean he likes some people more than he does to others? Because it's very obvious when you look around, you're going to see that there are people who receive his help a lot more than other people. The Bible tells us that God is not a respecter of persons. And I said yesterday that the Godhead consists of three people, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three separate individuals, but one God. And that is one of the mysteries of the kingdom. We may not completely understand how this works, but when you look at the word God in the Hebrew, you're looking at what's called, and we're going to get into you know, just some grammar here, a uniplural noun. What do we mean by that? In other words, when you say God, you're not necessarily talking about one person. It's just like when you talk about a church. If we say the First Baptist Church, we're talking about one church. But if you go down to First Baptist Church, and usually there's a First Baptist Church in just about every community in our country, and you open the doors, you're going to find a lot of members. There are a lot of members who may have joined First Baptist Church. First Baptist Church consists of all those members, but it is a one church. When we talk about a uniplural noun, that's what we're talking about, just like church. There are many members, but one First Baptist Church. In the same sense, God is one, but it has three members, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We can see in different areas throughout the Bible all three operating at once. I used the example from 2 Corinthians 13, 14 yesterday when Paul said the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion, the sharing together, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If there is only one person, why did Paul say the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God? And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Why didn't he just say the grace of God, the love of God, and the fellowship of God be with you all? Because he recognized and had a revelation that when we talk about God, we are talking about three different people. It is often hard to understand the difference between the people because they operate as a single unit. There is very it's there's so much overlap between their ministries and their functions. And that's one thing as we start doing this, and we start recognizing the Holy Spirit, we start learning about him that you must be mindful of. We're not talking about getting into legalism, saying one does this, one does that, one does this. It is very rare to see anything in the Bible where it's referencing one, the other two are not working. You may not always get the terminology right, but it's what's important is not being right in every jot and tittle in, in, in your understanding like there's some people say well i was fellowshipping with god today is that wrong to say you know technically they were fellowshipping of the holy spirit 
but the Holy Spirit is God. We fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We pray to the Father. There are different aspects here. You're not always going to get it right because in our natural understanding, this is something you can only learn by revelation. I can explain it to you, but it comes by revelation of the Holy Spirit as He reveals it to you. So don't get hung up in terminology and don't get hung up in understanding every little point of this. The key that I want you to understand is the Holy Spirit is a person and He wants to get to know you. We looked at the fact that Jesus referred to him using masculine pronouns in John 14, 15, and 16, saying he, when he comes, he will show you, he will guide you. He is a knowable person. Romans chapter 8 in verse 14 says that the sons of God, or we could say the daughters of God, will be led by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit desires to lead us, to guide us. So why is it, and I said at the beginning of the video, there's some people who seem to be led more by him than others. Why is it that it seems like some people receive more help from the Holy Spirit than others? If he is not a respecter of persons, why is this? It is because some have learned to look to him. Some have developed that revelation, that understanding that he is a person standing by wanting to help us, to guide us, to lead us. And because they have developed this revelation, they look to him in every aspect of their life. They would wake up in the morning. Should I go ahead and eat breakfast first or should I just go ahead and brush my teeth? Should I wear this shirt or that shirt? Always looking to him for guidance, for leading. Do we have to go to that level? No, we don't. But the more you look to him, the more you ask for his help, the more awareness you will develop of his presence. And that's why these people have come to this point. That's why we get to this point where we start asking him to be involved in every aspect of our life. Should I eat this cereal? Should I eat that cereal? I'm driving to work. I always have the same route. When I come into a stoplight, do I keep going the way I normally do? Do I turn left? Do I turn right? The Holy Spirit will guide you. He will lead you and he will protect you. I remember a number of years ago, I heard a story of a minister he and his wife, and I think I've shared this in these videos before, but he and his wife were traveling from California to Texas, and, and he was in a hurry trying to get the car packed. They were in a hurry. And as he's packing the car, his wife is in the hotel room, and he just kept getting this urge, wait five minutes. Wait five minutes. It didn't make sense, and they were in a hurry, so he got the car packed. He went in and got her. They got in the car. And on the way to Texas... They were in a massive car wreck. And the minister that was sharing the story said that they had gotten up to the service he was at and gave the testimony because she had a, she was almost at death's door. Her injuries were so massive from that car accident. They testified about how God raised her up in the hospital, miraculous healing, and everybody in the service was going crazy. But then the minister stopped and said, but wait, that testimony would not have happened if he had listened and responded to the Holy Spirit's prompting to wait five minutes. I've heard people talk about, you know, we look at accidents and things happen with Christians. Why did God allow that to happen? If you will go back and look at it and look at things that have happened in your life, oftentimes you will notice that you had these little thoughts come up. The Holy Spirit doesn't talk to us in audible voice. He doesn't talk to us, you know, go to the right, go to the left. He doesn't talk to us like that. Sometimes it's just a small prompting. Wait five minutes. It's not an audible voice. It's just this, this thought comes up. But he is guiding. He is leading. He is prompting. And he wants to guide us. He wants to lead us every step of the way. He wants to be involved in every part of our life, but are we willing to look to him? Are we willing to take the time to sit back and just close our eyes and listen for his guidance and leading? 
back in the 40s and 50s in the U.S., there was a major healing revival. And there was a young man that was used mightily of God. There were many signs and wonders in his meetings. And there was a story told about a church that he came to. They'd set up a tent. There were thousands of people waiting for the meeting to start. They went through the worship, and the young man did not arrive on time. They played some more songs. The young man still did not arrive at the tent. So they sent someone, I believe, if I'm remembering the story correctly, they sent a child to his hotel room to find out what was going on, to see if he was okay, to see if he needed help. And the person that was sent arrived at the hotel room, knocked on the door, and he answered the door, and they said, well, the service is starting. And he said, well, I can't go right now. There were thousands of people waiting for him with an expectation for him to be ministering. And the person was like, why? And he said, because I haven't been led. I'm waiting. And as they're talking, suddenly the young man just ran past the person that came to get him. And he ran out. And I, I, I can't remember if the hotel was close to the tent or how it worked, but he ran out. He ran to the tent and the power of God just fell. Miracle signs and wonders. This young man... Had, this minister had learned to wait. He wasn't pressured by the fact that the music had started. He wasn't pressured by the fact that thousands of people had shown up to experience the power of God. He was not going to move until he felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit because he recognized that he had nothing to offer anyone in that service. And when we were talking about in the past month, Paul in Philippians chapter 3, when he said, when he went through his pedigree, looked at all of his accomplishments and everything else and said, they, they are but dumb. It was because he understood that he had nothing to give his readers. The churches that he had started, the people that were touched through his ministry, he, Paul, had nothing to offer them. But the Holy Spirit within him third person of the trinity that anointed him that led him that guided him had everything to offer them we can cling to our natural successes the things that we have accomplished we can join paul and say that is nothing compared to the excellency of the knowledge of jesus christ and that is what we talk about when we talk about the price of the anointing. We can cling to our successes. We can cling to our achievements. We can stand up in services and talk about what we have done. Or we can stand up and introduce people to the one who will show Jesus. Jesus talked about in his ministry, if you lift me up, I will draw all men. How do we lift Jesus up? We just lift Jesus up by learning to yield to the Holy Spirit. And that's where, the Holy, where John, Jesus is talking about in John chapter 16. Let's go back and look at this. In verse 13, John chapter 16 and verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he sh shall hear, that shall he speak. I think it's very important for us to learn these lessons. He shall not speak of himself. How many of us in the ministry, how many of us as Christians, spend the entire time speaking of ourselves? We need to learn to yield to the Holy Spirit. He desires to have fellowship with us. He desires to have relationship with us. He desires to work through us. He desires to touch the world around us. We talk about a desire for the power to pour out. But the power poured out, and you can see in Acts chapter 2, the power poured out on the day of Pentecost. The power poured out in the person of the Holy Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit, 
is dwelling in our spirit. If you've never met Jesus and you've never asked him to be your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that you just believe in your heart and confess Jesus as Lord. The Holy Spirit is waiting. When you make that prayer, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I believe in my heart that you died and rose from the dead to save me. And I receive your free gift of salvation. And I ask you to take my life and be my Lord and Savior. When you do that, He, the Holy Spirit, takes you, takes your spirit, immerses you into Christ. Your old sinful spiritual nature dies at that moment. And you are resurrected, a new creation in Christ Jesus. But it is He, the Holy Spirit, that does the work. Jesus paid the price with his blood. Jesus obtained our redemption. But it is he, the Holy Spirit, that manifests that new creation within our spirit. It is he, the Holy Spirit, that immerses us into Jesus. It is he, the Holy Spirit, that is filling you now. The more you learn to look away from self to he, the Holy Spirit, the more you will be positioned to walk in the power of God. It is not that the power has passed away. It is not that we're waiting for the power to be poured out because He, the Holy Spirit, is within us. He is longing to pour out through us. I shared in a recent video that in the past few months, he, the Holy Spirit, not in an audible voice, just in that still small voice that he'll talk to all of us, spoke to me and told me the church is praying for an outpouring. The world is waiting for an outflowing. What is hindering that outflowing? Self. Because we're so busy talking about ourselves and our accomplishment, our deeds, what we did, I mean, think about how people talk, how Christians talk. I believe God for this, and I receive this. I called out to God. I, that word I, needs to be taken out of our vocabulary, and I'm just as guilty as the next person. It needs to be about He, Jesus. It needs to be about He, the Holy Spirit. But we even see that humility in the Holy Spirit's ministry in Jesus' statement. He said, when He, the Holy Spirit, has come, He will guide you into all truth. How does He guide us into all truth? It says, He shall not speak of Himself, but whatever He hear, that shall He speak. What would Christianity look like today if you and I could learn this one simple secret that when we talk we are only saying what we have heard from him the Holy Spirit if you have made Jesus the Lord of your life he has taken up residence in your spirit you have the power of God inside of your spirit the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling inside of you in the person of the Holy Spirit. And He, the Holy Spirit, desires to have a relationship with you. He's the one that brought Jesus out of death, hell, and the grave. And He is the one that is dwelling within you right now. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, you'll see that He, the Holy Spirit, was moving over the face of the waters. And when God spoke, let there be light, or literally in the Hebrew, light be, it was He, the Holy Spirit, that went into action and caused the words that God spoke to manifest light. In the same sense, when you learn to yield fully to the Holy Spirit, when you learn to completely let go of the self-nature, and I believe that's what Paul was telling us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Present, just as Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, present your achievements, your successes, your education as a living sacrifice to him, to Jesus. 
place it on the altar of his presence and see what the Holy Spirit will do. See what the Holy Spirit will do in your life. He wants to move. He wants to touch you. He wants to guide you. But you must yield to him. In this busy, busy world that we live in, we need to learn to slow down and relearn the art of being quiet. He, the Holy Spirit, desires to manifest in your life. He wants to touch you. He wants to fill you. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. But you have to acknowledge his presence. And that's what Jesus was telling us here in John chapter 16. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And then he goes on to tell us what he will hear. He says, he'll show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So he is hearing from Jesus. And we're coming to the end of this video, but if you look in John chapter 8, you'll see that Jesus was taught of the Father, and he only spoke what he heard from the Father. And now he's telling us, the Holy Spirit shall receive from Jesus. And this is where I was talking about. They all work together. The Holy Spirit hears what Jesus is saying and conveys it to us. Jesus hears what the Father is saying and conveys it to the Holy Spirit. So when we speak what we hear, not from an intellectual exercise, not from our knowledge that we learned in books, but when we speak what we hear from the Holy Spirit, we're speaking forth the revelation of Jesus Christ. This was the gospel that Paul preached. This was the gospel that Paul talked about. It was the revelation of Jesus Christ that he learned in times of fellowship and communion with the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for each one that's watching these videos. Thank you, for Holy Spirit, for drawing them from all points of the compass. We thank you for your goodness, Lord, and for opening the eyes of our understanding, teaching us, guiding us, and leading us. Show us Jesus, Holy Spirit, show us yourself. Help us to learn to know you, to develop that relationship, to walk with you. I just bless each person. And we thank you that your power is manifesting in their lives. And we give you all glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.